ramen uh, discussions about good ramen places to eat. Uh, get get started here. Uh, ben, it's great to have you on with us. Um, and uh, just for everybody's uh, information, so we have uh, Ben Stansel. Um, he's the chief analytics officer at Mode. And um, the way he came on our radar uh, was interesting. Uh, you know, Katie read a, a Medium article that he had posted. And, um, you know, he, he sent it over to me and I, I was reading it. And I don't have a lot of times that I've laughed out loud reading about analytics. Um, <laughs> belly laughed, you know, but for those that know, they know. So um, really appreciate you coming on with us, Ben. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, it's excited to, excited to talk with you all. Yeah, so the title of the the article is "Data's Big Whiff," and uh, and what's great about it is there's some realism that's really injected into it. Some realism that you really don't get by just like listening to BI vendors come in and you know have their pre sales team uh, do a hard sell on on how magical analytics are going to be. Um, and um, and 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 just out of curiosity, like what what brought you to write the article? I mean, usually people write the, write articles like this out of some kind of frustration or or another. Um, so a big part of what I do is is basically just trying to have conversations with folks around the community. So mode for for a little background, mode is a is an analytic product. It's built for mm -hmm. for data folks. Um, and so a big part of my role is to kind of understand the problems they have and things like that. Uh, and so I I spend a fair amount of time talking to people, just trying to understand what it is that they're trying to do, what they like, mm -hmm. what they don't like. Um, and so I think it was partly just sort of hearing the same frustrations from people that were, mm -hmm. were the ones that I've had before. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I don't know, it, it ended up turning into a, I might as well yell into the void on the internet <laughs> uh, about those things and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. So, there, hey, Arcadie. Good hey, gentlemen. All right. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things you, you mentioned in in the article was you know data science are just answering the same ad hoc questions and and and, and you know I'm answering the same questions that I answered just a month ago. You know, go go into that some of the 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 um, experiences you've had in that. Yeah, I mean this is this is sort of the the reoccurring pain point for every data scientist in some form or another is this I'm constantly bogged down by questions that that are things that I feel like I shouldn't have to answer over and over again. They're kind of the boring questions or the, the can you just get this or isn't it just that or, you know, the, like, can you pull this? Um, and so, you know, I think, I think like in my own experience, you get a lot of those, you get a lot of the things where you feel like, hey, I'm, I'm able to do much more than this. I want to answer these exciting things. I want to kind of like let my curiosity about where the business is going and these big questions kind of kind of take me where it's going to go uh, yeah. but you end up sort of doing the the mundane paperwork uh yeah. that isn't the exciting thing i think it's I, one of the analogies i often use for for analysts is they're kind of like detectives um and and i feel like this sort of thing is the the sitting behind the desk like filling out the forms you like <laughs> i want to go out and try to solve the big mystery but you know i'm, I'm bogged down by sort of office office red tape uh mm -hmm. before i can mm -hmm. do it and and you're always one step away from being out the door uh and then something new comes in that, that holds you back and so it's i think a lot of it is just that kind of thing of like yep. the sense that there's more out there but but you can never quite get to it right right yeah one of the challenges is a lot of times you whether you get a tabular report or you get a dashboard especially if you get a dashboard so it's yellow or it's uh orange or if it's uh red what is what does it mean and and typically yeah your your exploration just begins there it's not it's not the end it's just the beginning yeah yeah and and, and I, I think that um you know those teams that want to be productive in the in, in those discussions I, I think you put it well in that they really their world sits in basically two uh two buckets you know one being just sort of um what you call the dashboarding um and, and the other being ad hoc. So go into that like split and what that what that is like for uh, the data analysts. Yeah, that, a lot of times it, it's this, you, people sort of draw these lines in lots of different ways. They're sort of like BI yeah. versus analytics or, or ad mm -hmm. hoc versus reporting or or, you know, dashboarding versus strategic questions or boring versus exciting mm -hmm. uh, where where part of it is 
the important work of making sure everybody in the business has the information they need to do their data. But in some ways feels mechanical. Mm -hmm. you know, that it's like, great, you know, you have the thing up on the TV screen so that every executive knows how much we're making this quarter or mm -hmm. you know, the product team knows how much people are using the product that isn't really answering a question. You're just sort of doing the like janitorial work to make sure the system works. And I think yeah. for some people, that's very interesting. For some people, that's that's people like building those systems. They like kind of being the maintainers of something. They like having their their sort of castle that they can keep clean. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, I think, get into data because they are curious, because they they like playing with data and trying to understand things from it. And they have a bunch of questions about how the world works. Yeah. And, and they see data as a way to, to help them understand that. And there's not really any of that in the dashboarding thing. You're not trying to answer a question or understand anything. You're just trying yeah. to trying to project reality, basically. And so mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, that's that's sort of the the tease is you get into the field to to do these bigger things, to figure stuff out. You want to kind of have like the aha moment when you're doing something yep. late at night, you know, like, oh my God, mm -hmm. wait a minute, all right. of these things connect. Um, and you don't get that from, from reporting essentially. Like mm -hmm. you, reporting is the, is the thing that is often the first lead that you see, but, but as you're building that, that you get all these little nuggets of like, oh, I need to go look at that. I need to go look at that. I need to go look yeah, at that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I think what makes people happy is the ability to pursue that. And if you're kind of constantly mired in the like, I'm just continuing to churn out more kind of reporting or or basic question answering that's it's kind of rote rather than rather than this kind of exploratory or or creative type of work, then mm -hmm. it feels like, yeah, you're being held back from from something else. It's like an artist who wants to be able to paint a picture, but they're having to do everything color by numbers. Like it feels like you're just <laughs> you're just held back. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's there's, you know. On one side, the uh, the organization wants just r repeatable stuff, and then on the other, you know, there's questions that get answered from the repeat or that get asked from the repeatable stuff. That you know, you start asking, well, what's the priority? Is it to keep the repeatable stuff, you know, moving, or is it is it to actually answer a question? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, and there's there's a lot of. I mean, I think that's there are organizational sort of pathologies around it too, where you know, lots of people ask questions just sort of they feel like they need to they're trying to put together a presentation to make an argument about why they should do something and they need mm -hmm. some data to back it up and they're like can you pull these numbers for me and i'll choose the one chart that helped my case um but again that's that's often not the sort of thing that gets people into into data jobs in the first place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and one of the things you talked about in the in your article is just the types of decisions being made and um you mentioned the bezos one door uh, one-way door decisions. You know, I, a lot of people know that, but there's a lot of people that don't know about that, what that means. What What is the, talk about the Bezos, you know, one-way door decisions. Yeah, so so he has, this kind of comes from like the Amazon operating principles bit mm -hmm. that I think came from a, like a Bezos shareholder letter or something a few years mm -hmm. ago. I think it was probably 10 years ago now. Um, essentially, he, he says that a big part of what Amazon tries to do is make decisions quickly. That, that decision making speed is important. You don't want to get mired in kind of this like analysis paralysis type yeah. of thing. Uh, and one of the ways in which they try to do that is recognize which doors, which decisions are, are one way doors versus two way doors. And, and what he means by this is what are the decisions that once you make them, you can't go back? Uh, and mm -hmm. what are the decisions mm -hmm. that if you make them and it doesn't work out, like, okay, sort of no big deal. Um, and so, you know, examples of this are in Amazon's case, like, where are we going to build our new headquarters? Probably can't build the new headquarters and be like, didn't work there. Let's move somewhere else. Uh, like you got to get that right. Um, yeah. But a decision about, you know, what, what ad do we run? Yeah. If it doesn't work, run another one. Um, yeah, and yeah. so I think they, they want to not spend too much time focused on, on the two way doors because it's just not that important to get it right. Like you can, mm -hmm. you can end up being a lot more costly trying to figure out exactly how to do it. If, if really it's like, try one, it doesn't work, try something else. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to me, you know, a lot of the, the analysts should be more focused on the one way doors. Um, that's where getting it right matters. That's where their time matters. Uh, but I think a lot of times the things sort of these reporting stuff is is kind of enabling people to make these two way door decisions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and those things, I think, again, it, it, it's it I think can drive the sense for, for a data team that what we're doing doesn't matter if great. Someone's coming to us, asking us a question. We give them an answer. They try it. Okay. They go back and try something else. Like, why did you bother with the analysis in the first mm -hmm, place if, mm -hmm. if it wasn't so important? So, 
Yeah, the, the, the one-way and two-way door thing, I'd never really thought about it in those, that form. And I, and I think that that, um, that, that kind of uh, approach to even uh, starting the discussion about analytics is super helpful because it, uh, it, it allows, number one, the organization to make a decision to be definitive about it. Um, and, and especially in the case if it's a two-way door, to not obsess about it. You know, let's just get done with this because we're, we're, we're obsessing about something that's totally meaningless. Um, the second is on a, on a one-way door decision, it could be that your sort of deterministic analytics, the ones that are already pre-built and everything like that, they might answer a lot of questions related to the one-way door. But this is really where you actually might want to spend some time probing into the yellow light and the, you know, the uh, what, what might be an issue in the deployment. Um, you know, do we have all the data? Do we need to supplement some data to this decision? Um, all, all of that sort of um, sort of stuff. Are we getting our data from, you know, trusted sourcing um, versus just, you know, did someone just pull this out of their hat? <clears throat> so I think it's a significant sort of discovery yeah. or observation. And, and I think there's, there's something to it also where I mean, there is like a responsibility of the organization, I think, to sort of ask analysts the right types of questions to not basically bog analysts down with the two-way mm -hmm. doors. Um, but I also think there's, there is a, a responsibility from analysts and analysts aren't always good at this. And I like coming from that background, I know my own tendencies here, uh, where you often want to get the decision right. You see a decision and you're like, all right, we need to do the analysis so that we understand what this is. And in a lot of cases, that's, that's I, I feel like it is a, a sort of defense mechanism to having to make a decision under uncertainty. Um, mm. That sometimes you're just not gonna know, like the data yeah. will not tell you what to do and what's actually, and this is both for like two-way and one-way doors that matter yeah. more for the one-way ones. Sometimes the data is just not gonna tell you what to do. And like what you have to do in those cases, you can't, you can't sort of keep pushing, trying to say, well, we need to figure this out. Like at some point, what it really means is you have to just make a decision without actually knowing what's gonna happen. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think, I think analysts have a tendency to want to over index on like, we need to figure out what to do. We need to continue to run the numbers until we have come to a conclusive result. And it may be, you just don't have a conclusive result. Like yeah. at some point you got to choose, you got to choose red or black on the roulette table. And like the numbers aren't going to tell you which one you just got to make your bet. <laughs> Uh, and I think yeah. data, data people can get, it, it's sort of out of character for them. So in those cases, in a roulette wheel, it's like obvious that there's no right choice. In other cases, you can kind of like keep forcing it until you're like, well, we have to figure out the better odds. And the odds may just be 50-50. Yeah, and it may be that the right decision there or the right um, approach there is to define um, how we would measure it, 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 given that we don't have the data. Once the decision is made, how are we going to measure whether we're successful at the decision? Um, you know, we obviously can't look historically, but let's look look uh, tactically at at the decision results. Um, hopefully, we can walk the, walk back through the door if it's if it's too bad. <laughs> yeah, and I, I agree with that. Though within bounds, I think this is an, another yeah. another sort of analytical tendency can be. Mm -hmm to do that and then be like, oh, wow, we made the wrong thing. We got to pull back. And you end up kind of waffling too much on it. It's like sometimes yeah, yeah, the right yeah. decision is to just keep doing the thing that you said you were going to do and like commit to it. And and it's, I don't know, it's like- Yeah, like, certainly for truly one-way door decisions, you kind of just have to go. I mean- Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nike it, Nike has a wonderful saying, just do it. And and sometimes I think <laughs> in, in the BI space or in the, in the analytical space, uh, the just do it attitude is missing. You want the 11 digits of precision and you want to know that you are advising your executives or your business stakeholders in, in the best way that the data tells you. And, and I do think this idea of uh, imprecision is also important. It's the fact that you may be directionally correct or you've got other things that are emotional that are entering into your decision cycle. And those things sometimes are not, not so easy to necessarily model or display. Yeah. And, and on the, you know, if, if you're, if you're making a bet on something and you're saying, well, I think I have no idea what an analogy here would be, but like this path is a 40% chance of success. This path is a 60% chance of success. Like the, those percentages only stay if you continue to stay on the path, you get on the 40 and be like, oh, we should be on the 60 and go to the 60 and like, well, maybe we should be on the 40. Like now you're just walking down the middle of the forest and you've probably got like a 0% chance. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I think there's, there's a tendency <laughs> to want to like find the optimal path. It's like the optimal path may just be whichever one you chose at that point, that's where you need to be. 
Yeah, yeah. Ben, Jared and I are incredibly excited about sort of the evolution of, of this thing we call business intelligence or analytical uh, data science platforms. Part of it is we've sort of gone from pixel perfect reporting, you know, which we started in the <laughs> years and years days, ago, years and years ago. Um, and then there was this idea of it's really hard. I've got all of these crystal reports everywhere. Let's let's figure out a better way. And so three big BI vendors emerge. We're excited about the evolution that has happened since then. So if you look at mode and think about the journey leading up to this, a lot of times Rich and I talk about this with customers all the time. We start on the right side of the proverbial data architecture equation. We focus on the customer. We focus on what questions we need to answer, but many are still very much focused on the data. So this idea of data catalogs and let's build bigger and bigger data lakes is, is taking place. What are you seeing in the marketplace and how is Mode reacting to sort of the, the evolution of the analyst engineer, if you will? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's still something that seems very much changing. Like it's, it's very much a shifting landscape, I think. Um, the, the thing that we see implicitly, like people don't really see it this way. People will see it once you tell them, but they don't sort of describe it to us this way, is the role of any kind of data consumption, whether or not that's BI or analytics or to some extent data science, like data science for the sake of making decisions, not sort of ML engineering data science for, for right. building production models. Um, all of those things are super jumbled where there aren't clear lines between okay, this is our crystal reports that we use for like the executive binders that they look at every week. And then we have a data team that's trying to answer questions from other people on the business. And then we have data scientists who are off like living in a hole trying to solve problems like forecasting problems with advanced models. All those things kind of blend together where there's the reporting that, that executives want, wants the forecast that are the models. And the reporting also generates, like you said, a bunch of the questions that are the things that people need to answer. And so the lines around like what's what there is is very unclear. Um, and so I, how that evolves, I think it still kind of remains to be seen. But one of the big things that we think is important is, I guess, well, two things. One is across that spectrum, people need to be able to work together, that, that it doesn't work if we fragment that up where it's like, well, we have our reporting and dashboard here. We have our analytics here. We have our data science here. Like those two things are too, too intermingled. It's too much of a spectrum where if we break them up, we end up like losing a lot of the value of each part of it by not having them being able to build on top of each other. The other thing is I think there is there is a, the sort of lower layers of what was BI are getting basically taken away into other, other services. So all of like the data modeling is getting pulled out into tools like DBT. Uh, some of the metric definition is now getting pulled out into similar tools or, or other tools like ETLs mm -hmm. obviously owned somewhere else, data storage is owned somewhere else. So it's it's this the way I've described this before is it's it's like sort of a pivot where it used to be that BI tools were like reporting end to end they would handle the entire right. stack they would do storage they would do transformation but it was just reporting and now it's kind of like all that stuff underneath it has been stripped away but the layer on top the kind of consumption layer is much more expansive like it's a much wider but shallower piece of piece of technology so I think that's how people kind of want to use it how that evolves in the market, like kind of remains to be seen from Mode's perspective, we try to solve that problem by saying, Hey, we give you a tool that can be off, like basically a place where analysts can feel at home as well as the people that they're consuming their work. Um, but I think that's, that's, you know, there's a lot of stuff shifting in, in the landscape that, that it still, I think has some time to shake out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. completely agree. And I think we've, uh, Jared and I have talked about sort of the uh, H2Os and the data IQs and, and, and sort of some of the things that are going on there. Uh, versus what I've described as the canvas. So the the, the place where uh, mode plays and some of the uh, others in the marketplace have, have played is essentially providing you the canvas in which you as the artist, as the analyst data scientist or analyst uh, engineer or BI person have the opportunity to collaborate. And I think this idea of bringing those multiple disciplines into the same uh, canvas is is really exciting because I think a lot of people are still focused on, you know, the briefing, uh, sort of generating a, 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 a static document and maybe parameter driven document. Uh, and then your data science lives elsewhere and your exploration lives elsewhere as well. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's there's an interesting, I think, kind of parallel with I don't know if you're all familiar with with Figma, the design yes, product. Yes, of course. Um, so so the way Figma has kind of worked, I mean, part of it is if people aren't familiar, Figma is basically like a like a Photoshop in a browser. Essentially, mm-hmm. it's it's mm-hmm. it's not quite Photoshop because it's designed more for like uh, product designers instead of instead of people who are trying to create sort of creative materials like ads and stuff. But mm-hmm. same idea. And one of the things that Figma did was by putting it in the browser and making it easy to share and comment and things like that with non-designers, they essentially expanded the design process where it used to be design would be like, okay, there's a process that's happening on the design team. They would create an asset and that asset would get kicked out to a product manager and executive. Like, what do you think of it? They'd comment on it in an email. The thing would come back to the design process. Designers would work on it again and kick it back out. And by making it so that like with Figma, designers could just share things off to other people. Those people became more players in the design process that were like mm-hmm. providing contributions throughout that could look at things, and interact with things very quickly. And so it wasn't just about saying, hey, like designers can use more ways to collaborate. It's about saying design isn't just what happens between designers. Designers is, design is this entire process that requires designers, it requires stakeholders, it requires executives, whoever else. And I think analytics is kind of a similar thing where it can't be something where it's like the analysis happens among the team and they kick off pieces to executives that then they ask more questions and it comes back to the team and it's sort of like this back and forth. Mm-hmm. Those executives need to be a part of the same process. They need yeah, to be yeah. able to interact in the same way where everybody's working on the stuff together instead of it being kind of a work on it in a small group, eject something, work on it in a group, eject something. So to me, that's kind of how I, I see a lot of this stuff needing to evolve. I, I think that's a great analogy because essentially you're, you're distri- describing sort of the the ultimate customer as the one who's participating in the design process in 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 terms of capturing the things that they want. I've often described a uh, Chinese wall that existed between the data people and the BI people. So your mm-hmm. ETL team, your data modeling team, is completely segregated from your BI team, and that is completely segregated from your business. And so what you right. end up with is you know cycles that you go through unnecessary cycles of trying to collaborate with them uh, by by sending things and delivering releases without necessarily having them be an active participant. Yeah, and I think that the, 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 the BI model world where it's like we have a semantic model, we model data, and then other people consume it, I agree, became that sort of wall where it's it's the sort of the, the, the way that IT and, and BI developers are essentially communicating with the rest of the business is through this kind of translation of a semantic model. And I think the model itself can be valuable. It can support a lot of things, but like those people need to have a different shared language than a semantic model. They need to be able to talk to each other more directly. It's like, Hey, we're trying to solve these problems. How would you solve it? Like it can't be something where it's okay. We have a list of requirements from stakeholders. We're going to go model something, give you the asset. You use it for a while. You tell us what your requirements are like that. That wall needs to be something that's a lot more, human basically in my opinion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah the the um the, and a lot of what you you speak about in 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 the article you were talking it, it's it's the ad hoc analytics that that you say are sort, sort of the it's it's the area that um you start the article off saying you know it's the same analytic i worked on last time um but it's that's the stuff that that is probably like the most important stuff that you're you're producing for the for the organization. Um, and one of the things you mentioned is that you know self serve analytics and dashboards, those are basically the same categories. Like double click into that a little bit, and you know, because BI vendors, they like to sell, they like to sell those as modules, you know. But but in reality, I mean, what is how does that end up? looking in the organization or behaving yeah so it's like self-serve is one of those things that's sort of a, a term without a definition um mm-hmm. everybody kind of has a sense of what it, they think it means but nobody's are quite the same like it's a little bit like i know it when i see it but the way i describe it is not the same as the way you describe it um <laughs> my answer to it in in the way that i think people are sort of thinking about it a little bit more is it isn't a set of features it is i mean something you have to back it with a set of features, but it's essentially like an experience that that people have when they are trying to answer questions. That it's, you wanna be able to have people who can come, who can say like, I have a question, you get the answer with a relatively low friction process, 
uh, I trust that answer. And like, if you if you can do that, to me, that is self serve. Um, mm-hmm, that could mm-hmm. be something where you have a, a PI tool where you can drag and drop your way to stuff. It could be that it, like all of my questions can be answered with a PDF printout. And yeah. that's all I ever need. And so like I can self-serve everything with this piece of paper. It could be that self-serve, like this is, this is a bit controversial, but it could be that self-serve is me actually asking an analyst who just loves to answer those sorts of questions and can turn it around really fast. Like yeah. to me, what's the difference? I'm, I'm just trying to get an answer and I get an answer. Yeah. And so like ultimately to, it's, it is the experience of not having to go back and forth with people, not having to like, put your name into a queue somewhere where eventually yeah, someone yeah, yeah. will pick up a ticket. Um, and so you can serve that in a lot of different ways. The dashboards are often part of that. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's people trying to do their own analysis. And sometimes it's something different. Arcady's Ar- 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 uh, turning on his leaf blower. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's <laughs> it's picking up the fact that, you know, it's it's the fall and people outside are cleaning up leaves. You can, you can hear it. That's great. Uh, I'll go and mute Jared. But, but one one quick thing in, related to that, I, I've often talked about this idea of why we want self service, and I've spoken to many executives about this topic, and and wonder if you've you've seen some of the same, which is it's the idea of really abdicating responsibility. Uh, IT takes too long. Everything is a project, and so the idea of self serve, and I think the the upstart of the, the data lake movement, the data swamp movement, the upstart of sort of data catalogs, let's catalog all of the data that we've got and, and somehow that will immediately enable our organization to be successful, is all a reaction to the fact that it takes too long. And I think part of it, and you spoke to this earlier when you gave the Figma example, is the fact that the expectation is that you write a requirements document from that, you will deliver a dashboard, and then you turn it over, and by the time it's done, people have forgotten what the requirements were, and, they, and they've and they moved on. And so that's that's part of this, this sort of, I, I don't want my team to be doing it anymore. I'd like the business to, to own it, because we can never get it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, speed, I think, is a huge part of it, where it kind of gets back to, like, is it self-serve if I can ask a question and a human answers it, but they answer it in 15 minutes every time? It's like, kind of still feels like it basically is. Um, <laughs> the, the, yeah, I think there's a lot of, especially, so th- there's companies that are sort of like the, the digital natives or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call them, where I think they have a slightly different perspective on this. But the, the companies that are more traditional enterprises and, and thinking about this in more legacy ways, I think a lot of the self-serve is kind of the motivation is partly what you're describing. It's it's a sense that we need to be more data driven. We aren't entirely sure what that means. That means like data in everybody's hands, what they do with it, a little bit more of a question. Is it valuable? A little bit more of a question. But if everybody has dashboards where they're making decisions, then kind of the assumption is it's sort of the like dashboards question mark profit. And, and I don't know that, I think self-serve in some ways a reaction to that of like, well, we need everybody to have dashboards. We can't possibly build them all. Self-serve is a path to that. There is, I think, a like a second order question to that of like, well, is that valuable? Like, does that, right. does that, and mm-hmm. I think it certainly can be, but, but not in a way where the end goal is just get data into people's hands. Um, yeah. That they need to be having decisions they're trying to make with it. The data needs to be interpreted correctly that's not always easy it needs to be reliable like all those mm-hmm. things are kind of prerequisites to any of this making any sense but i do think there's there's some pressure of just like we have to modernize part of modernizing organization is more data it's more self-serve it's more things along those lines so you know I, i've had an executive tell me uh, i wish we could go back to green bar reports uh, and some <laughs> listeners may not know what those are but you know in the green bar report days it was really simple you you click a button you get a report and that's it you you use a highlighter and, and you're done it's self service and, and a ruler yeah. and a ruler exactly that was your self service because you, <laughs> you you had uh, 12 reports and you'd line them up and you 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 do the work i think as we've moved on the the challenge is sort of the citizen data scientist, citizen analyst is, is I think, the, the the big driver. But how to get think, there, I think people well, are still struggling. I think part of the complexity, and I just saw this uh, last week, there's a Harvard professor. It's an old set of videos. Um, uh, a Harvard professor was going through, uh, his name is Dr. Peterson, and he was going through... Um, 
uh, how people perceive um, reality, uh, how, how people per perceive things, uh, information, how they perceive information. And he said, you know, when you walked into this classroom, you saw a bunch of chairs that were pointing in, in this direction. Now, you didn't, you didn't consciously like define each chair and all of these things. You, the chair is self-evident uh, 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 to you as a place to sit. And they're all pointing in the same direction as if to signal to you that this is, you're, you're, we're all going to be listening to something that's pointing in that direction. He said, so the entire world presents itself to the, to you this way. You don't have to go through, you know, and, uh, and map that meaning out every single time you go and, and, and look at something. But as I was listening to that, I thought, you know, that is true. However, our world of data to information management is very much not that way. It's, it, it, I have no idea uh, whether what I'm looking at is meaningful to a department. I mean, I've got to really sit down and, and, and investigate this thing. And this is the reason why analysts end up being so important is because someone has to map that meaning to me. I have to have someone map it to something that, I'm in, that I can understand. Uh, I can't just walk in and look at a report and say, this is what it means. Um, there's a lot of interpretation involved in, in looking at data that we are not naturally adapted to just consuming. Um, and so, you know, the more that I can centralized, centralize assets uh, necessary to help me map that meaning out, uh, the, the, the stronger it is in terms of helping me understand how to, uh, what decisions to make. Yeah. And so I think that I, I agree with that. And I think there's something that to, to Arcadia, what you were saying about like highlighter, basically printouts and highlighters, um, where one of the other tendencies I think we get into now, partly because we have the technology to do it is give people so much data that it's so hard to actually derive meaning from it. <laughs> that, that like self-serve is it's easy when you see something to be like, Hey, can I get it in a slightly different way? Can I get this cut? That's a little bit different. Can I, you know, you show me by segment. Can I see it by segment and also by month instead of by quarter, whatever, mm -hmm. like you get there, there's sort of infinite permutations of those kinds of things. And a lot of times I think like with data, you can always sort of imbue some meaning in it, whether or not it's there or not. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easy to do that, where in practice, you don't actually need that much to make the decision. The an analogy that I've used before is, is Yelp. So Yelp is like a thing that has made us all fairly data driven in the way that we probably go out to eat. Um, that a lot, like if you go somewhere new, basically like you can't but go to Yelp and look stuff up. Yeah, for sure. and, and Yelp does a pretty good job of making <clears throat> good decisions for us. And the amount of data that Yelp gives you is a one to 10 score. That's it. Like yep. there is so much more that they could give you where it's like, oh, well, what's the score from different types of people? What about people who like different foods? What about like different scores for things like ambiance and price and, mm -hmm. and all the other things? Can I adjust it by the number of reviews? What about recent reviews? Like those are the sorts of things that if we were in a like BI setting, that's what people would be asking when they're trying to make a decision about where to go to eat. It's like mm -hmm. all these different details. Do they make better decisions than that? Then they went from a one to 10 score. That's like super opaque about how they actually even calculate it. Like it may just be the restaurant pays them to do it. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> that's good enough. Then so that's it's, another, I, yet another example of simplifying complexity. You know, this is the, the thing that we talk a lot about at Intricity. There's, there's never a data shark or an event that we cover that sort of that, that doesn't, doesn't get mentioned. Up. And that's really the, the key to it. It's not the volume. So, you know, I was at an event uh, on Wednesday night. <clears throat> We're talking about big data. This conversation about big data is still happening today. And to me, it's not about the quantity of data that you have. It's about uh -huh. the signal that you're able to get from it. And, and, I, and I think this is still a, very much a, an idea. So your Yelp example is a perfect, perfect analogy. It's, it's not, you know, how many data points you have on a dashboard. It's can you make decisions based on that? But I think the vector points that you have. The vector is important though, in, in terms of what Ben described <clears> as the, the or Bezos described as the one one way or two way door, right? Mm -hmm. So it really matters. That I think that piece honestly, that's that's something I hadn't thought a lot about when it comes to analytics. And I've been doing this for 20 years. But I you know, the the criticality of the decision. If it's not a, you know, eating where you eat is not that critical of a decision, you know, you know, uh, 
I mean, as long as it's not, uh, uh, you know, how in New York they have A, B, C, and D. I mean, as long as it's not one of those like <laughs> F. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if it goes ratings. down that far, but you know, as long as it's not that, you know, uh, it really, really, frankly, doesn't matter. Uh, so as long as we could place it in those vectors, I think uh, that's a pretty general rule that you could apply to it. And I think the simplicity of that one to ten rating is, you know, often. Uh, overlooked it, when and i think this kind of uh, this is circling back to that whole maps of meaning idea which is um i just I was just thinking about this while you guys were talking is if i need to go somewhere i already have a, a, a mapped meaning to navigation which is google maps or you know whatever i use for my app for navigation if i'm going to eat somewhere i already have that meaning mapped and so you know i think one thing that I think analytics teams can do is is build familiarity around you know certain analytical assets that people can use and they, they and, and that people can rely on. They they rely on the fact that this analysis is going to look this way. It's going to have these attributes, and it's going to produce this answer for me. So I know how to I know how to go you know get that done. I think it's the the complex ad hoc ones that you know uh, we have to. If we're doing ad hoc analysis, we have to, we're, we're literally like blazing a new trail. And so you know, being able to describe that analysis in more meeting is, is well, important. And, and how do you then organize that and share that? And so it's not just throw away. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's one of the things, Ben, you talk about in your article, you know, I'm doing the same analysis over <laughs> and over and over again. How do we organize it? How do we, how, you know, how do we share that? How do we, how do we become smarter as a whole, you know, based on this work that's that's cool and fun to do and, and not, you know, just putting, uh, you know, more, more, uh, you know, filters on a spreadsheet, like you said, or, or on a, a dashboard. But uh, and that's one of the challenges that I see. Some... I, I think there's still this idea that um, you can't have a conversation about business intelligence without talking about process. And, and I think a lot of people don't give that enough attention. I mean, Jared, when we were covering um, data governance, you gave perfect examples. You gave people exercises to do to sort of yeah, understand yeah. precision of data. But I, I do think this, this idea of understanding um, how people, what are you making decisions based on today? Mm -hmm. I've often given the example of the proverbial 100 sheet spreadsheet where they've got 99 sheets is all the data prep that they do, but the, the magic is actually on that last sheet 100. It's what are you looking at? What are the t eight things? What are the five things that you're looking at? Or, and, and Rich knows the examples where we've, we've been in organizations where we ask, you know, what are the KPIs that drive the business, whether it be based on your strategy or based on some other things. And sometimes we'll get a list of 300 KPIs that people want to look at. Uh, it sort of dilutes the idea of what's what's really a KPI. Maybe maybe you do have 300 KPIs, but ultimately the, the, a single individual is probably looking at two or three data points that they care most about. You know, do I have the sales? Do I have the customer uh, service rating that I that I'm looking to accomplish? Is marketing driving the, the the business? You know, am I retaining customers? Those are the typical things that 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 people will will typically gravitate to. Yeah, and that, that's a place too. Where I think if, if you end up creating 300 KPIs, which it's easy to do, um, you miss out on a lot of the benefits of of what data and BI can do that aren't just like you can make a better decision. But a lot of like the cultural elements of it is a tool for alignment. It is a tool to keep people sort of pointing in the same direction. It's a tool to to make sure everybody knows what matters. Um, whereas if everybody has their own KPI, like nobody has a KPI. Nobody, everybody's sort of growing in a different direction. Uh, that there's a lot of just organizational, like sort of process matters, a lot of organizational problems to me that data can help solve that aren't make us smarter and make us better decisions. It's just here is a here is a rhetorical device, essentially, that gets people excited about where we're going. This helps people see what the end, like finish line is supposed to look like um, that that I think is is kind of underused in, in that way. Like companies to me that use data really well aren't using it strictly for, for sort of the mathematical value that it provides. But are using it for the cultural value as well. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think culture always, you know, we talk about the four pillars, people, process, technology and culture. Culture trumps all all the other three every, every single day. You know, it eats eats the other three, I think, is the expression. Yeah. And, and, and for, yeah please, sir. No, and I was just going to say, a lot of people do not consider BI mm -hmm. as a cultural mechanism. They think of it as just some kind of performance thing. But but the idea that um, the idea that 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 you know, executives or strategies, whatever, whatever you want for your organization is executed literally through this mechanism to, of how we measure people or how we measure things. Um, it, it is one of the primary drivers of our culture in an organization um, because it, because it's the one thing that keeps updating all the time. We're always getting new data. And so if we can, if we put it in the framework of how we want the culture of the organization to unfold, uh, th then, th then we will successfully push the culture in that direction. Yeah, it, it's the town square. If you think about mm -hmm. it, so people come around, whether it, you know they're passing spreadsheets back and forth, or they're looking at a at a dashboard together, they're they're collaborating, and and that's the that's what sparks the conversation. Uh, we do have some executives that will not allow powerpoints to come into their meetings. They want to <laughs> see. Uh, a mode dashboard, and that's the only way they'll conduct their, their meetings. Yep. No problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, well, it's about trust in the data. You 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 didn't yeah, yeah. do anything to adulterate it. You mm -hmm. you've proven it. Uh, it's repeatable. It's not somebody who's interpreting uh, this data. You 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 interpret it once, and then you you make it part of your culture. So Ben, I, you, you uh, in your article, um, you suggested we should get rid of the name ad hoc ad hoc reporting or ad hoc analytics. Talk a little bit about that. What's the what's the what's the problem with that 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 idea, even in its in the way it's named? Uh, this is this is the point that Rich was making earlier to me. Is is it gives the sense of it being something that's temporary and meant to be thrown away, and it's it's not strictly what ad hoc means, but it, it's sort of the connotation of it to me is yep. very much we've got an ad hoc question. It's a one off thing. Like once I'm done with it, I'm done with it, and we'll move on. And there are cases when that is true. It's like, I've got, got a deck I've got to put together and I need to know, you know, how many, what is our retention rate for the quarter? Because I'm in a board meeting, tell me what the number is. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm, that away. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the things that, that are fall under the categorization of like ad hoc work are strategic questions. Like what should we price a new product at? Mm -hmm. And you can learn a ton from that. Even if you're not just making a decision, you can learn a lot about like how customers are buying the product and what, what different price points might do and how we think about it. Like there's a lot of things that you, next time you have a question somewhere in the galaxy of that kind of thing, you should be able to build on that. But unless we sort of recognize that we're, we're accumulating knowledge and not just answering a question, hmm. we're not going to actually accumulate any knowledge. And so to me, it's like, I don't, there's, there's, I think this is a very hard thing to do, but it's, it's trying to figure out, Hey, can we, can we turn this ad hoc stuff into something that is more, scientific in a way where we're building knowledge and sort of moving forward instead of something where we just forget about it. And like a heuristic for this to me is say you have an organization that's been doing ad hoc analysis for five years. Are you better off now than you were five years ago? Like, do you make better decisions today because of that? And most organizations I think would say, no, they like not really like they, they are better at probably answering ad hoc questions because yeah. they have a process around it. But do the fact that they answered those questions help them at all today? It's like, probably not. And that to me feels like a tremendous waste. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's learning from that. It was, I mean, completely unrelated, uh, but it was where I thought I was listening to somebody who was talking about marriage counseling. Um, he said he talked to this this couple. They'd been married for fifty years. He asked. He said, "How long have you been married?" The wife said, "We've been married for fifty years." The husband said, "No, no, 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 no. We've been married for one year fifty times. I don't know anything more uh, <laughs> now than I did after we were married for one year." And it's, I look at this in business, and I'm sometimes I'm like, "That's we're, really we're funny." Doing this thing over and over and over again, and why, how are we not learning from this? Why why can we not take this learning? We're we're putting time and effort. We've got these really smart people that are looking at this data and and coming up. You know, yeah, we we call it ad hoc analysis, right? But but they're looking at this. They're coming up with some really valuable insights and a way to get at those insights. And and we need to take it and, and say, how do we organize that? How do we build on top of that? How do we become better and smarter altogether 
through that so we can move forward. Is it because they, they, they focus too much on the end state and they don't think about the journey of getting there and there's, and there's pieces and parts of that journey that could be valuable in other places. And, and, and they just, they, they just can't visualize it. Maybe that's what it is. I, is. I think part of this is the attention deficit. I think it's the, <laughs> the, the focus right now is on this particular issue. This is what's important today. And so they'll go through, they'll do the analytics, they'll get to, to that answer. And that, and it's, it's a one-off answer. It's the ad hoc answer. It's sort of the throwaway answer. And if it's valuable, this is one of the challenges that BI yeah, can yeah. solve for an organization, which is the, if we're all sort of knowledge workers, whatever form that takes, that knowledge that we have in the organization is transient. We're going to be promoted from position to position. Um, I, I have an example of a retailer who I met with at five o'clock in the morning. He's a he's a buyer for this organization and he was in charge of cheese. And now he's moving to a different different group. And he wanted to know how am I going to transfer all this knowledge? Specifically, it was Excel, Excel reports that he was running. That took, That's the reason he's coming in at five o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> this knowledge that leaves organizations, whether it be through promotion or through you know, people moving from place to place, that's what disappears. And I think that's the opportunity that organizations have in terms of not just capturing their process, but also understanding how do you measure it? What's, what are the things that ultimately lead, lead to your success? And have a place where you can collaborate together. That's the other thing. You know, it's not a static document. You need a place where you can put commentary and you can ask questions and you, you can evolve it and continue to evolve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah that, I, go ahead. I, say, that, that, I think that's, there's like a Holy grail of, of data tooling process, whatever uh, that, that, that is one of those things. It's like, this is the point where we can get, where we actually, it's not really document, but, but learn mm -hmm. more easily and sort of pick up the, the kind of, ambient knowledge of this floating around organization uh, is a very, very hard problem to solve, it seems, but but sort of the the thing to me that is how we really accelerate an organization and how data actually becomes valuable. Like it, like it is it is the organizational enlightenment, basically, where mm -hmm. it literally took what you know an entire era of human history to figure out how to do this in society. And like organizations have not gone through that phase at all. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I look at the examples. Through. I look at the examples with Wiki, uh, Wikipedia as an example. Uh, I look at the examples of sort of folks trying to do early uh, SharePoint and, and prior to SharePoint, there were other sort of knowledge uh, capture systems, but I'm encouraged by the things that are going on with things like Rome and Notion, where for the individual, you've got ability to capture knowledge that's now trying to be so not, sort of your knowledge graph and then it's expanding into the enterprise so that there is a collaborative environment. There's a collaborative set of uh, notebooks. Notion is, is an example of that. I'm, I'm seeing more and more of that sort of collaboration taking place. Not a place to keep links like in SharePoint and, and upload documents or Dropbox or Box, but more of a knowledge sharing repository where I can embed something from uh, mode into that discussion and I don't have to leave that location. I, I create my content I, in many places, and then I have a collaborative environment in which to share it. I'm thinking maybe that's that's the next step in this in this evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the it's the the logic decoupling that logic from the single analytic, and so that it could be used in others, um, but also mapping some meaning to it, so people. Yeah, and this is a hard problem because, again, if, I, if I'm if i looking at it cold turkey and I'm just looking at a piece of logic that was written for something else, you know, how, how, do, I, how do I know if that's a good application for what I'm doing? You know, how do I know if it's going to work for me? And so it, it is, like you said, it's like the holy grail. It's it's almost uh, an obtainium uh, level holy grail in terms of uh, making it accessible to users in, in such an easy way that they could uh, acquire it. And, and I can think of a, a gazillion different ways to try and hack at it. Um, but certainly, um, um, you know, certainly there's, I think we'll get there at, at some point. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's, 
we, we will figure something out here. I don't know exactly what, and it may end up looking to me very different than kind of how we think it might look, but I think inevitably there will be some progress that we make. So, so Ben, in, in our last 10 minutes, give us a, give us a little bit about mode in terms of, you know, what was it, uh, was it the, uh, uh, a startup that started in the, in the garage and, you know, a, a bunch of buddies and, you know, got, got it out of, out on the market or how did, how did it come to pass and, um, and, and where are you guys at today? Yeah. So, so the origin of it was essentially an internal tool at a prior job. So, so we, it was started by me and two other folks. Um, mm -hmm. We were all members of a company called Yammer's data team. So Yammer mm -hmm. was a, it was like, Facebook for work before Facebook built Facebook for work. Uh, but it was very much kind of like a, a collaborative, a social network for companies essentially, where it was meant to be sort of a replacement to email. Um, Yammer was a company that was sort of, it was a SaaS company and one of the early kind of enterprise adopters of, of analytics and data science and the way that it has evolved today, where it's designed to help people make decisions, do things like A-B testing, all that kind of stuff. The sort of things like, social gaming really pushed on like mm -hmm, we want to mm -hmm. make our products better with with data was something that yammer invested a lot in so we were all members of that team uh and our job was was basically answer questions for the people in the business and it wasn't sort of the rote reporting stuff it was you know product vendors trying to decide between feature a or feature b how do we help them figure that out uh we didn't have tooling to help us do it um we didn't have like we were somewhat technical it was like sort of sql level of technical um answering questions like that. We wanted to be able to distribute that work to other people around the organization. We wanted to be able to like collaborate with them where it's like, they have a question, I answer it. We can get back, go back and forth really easily. And the only tools available to us were either sort of traditional BI tools um, that were much more about like dashboarding and reporting and that kind of stuff, or technical tools that were very isolated. That would be, I could use a desktop SQL editor. I could use Jupyter Notebooks were, you know, IPython, I guess at that point. Um, use something like that, but I can't share that with an executive. Like if I send a CEO a Jupyter notebook, like they're not going to do anything with it. <laughs> um, and so we ended up building kind of an internal tool that was basically a SQL browser. I mean, a SQL IDE in a browser uh, that had charts on top. That was a way for us to quickly do work and distribute it to the people in the organization. After a while, Yammer got bought. Um, it was bought by Microsoft. That product after that happened, a few things happened, which is like we saw that product start to spread, that internal tool start to spread around Microsoft. Um, we also started talking to more people around Silicon Valley and realized a lot of companies had built the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. That like Uber had a version, and and Airbnb had a version, and Facebook had a version, and LinkedIn had a version, and Spotify had a version, and Pinterest had a version, mm -hmm. and all these companies had essentially built a website where there was a query tool that you could write queries and share results. And we we're kind of like, hey, if, if everybody's building this. And there must be a market for for this more broadly. Also, yeah. like companies like those are building it, then is this sort of the next wave of what data tooling looks like? That's mm -hmm. gonna you know sort of follow in the in the in the footsteps of you know what sort of Tableau started to revolutionize, like opening up data and stuff like that. Like, will mm -hmm. sort of technical tooling be the next be the next phase? Um, so that was really where like the idea came from was seeing that, and then we left basically. As I said, the thing we had built was just an internal tool. It wasn't like we open sourced anything. It was essentially mm -hmm. a, okay, this internal tool is nice, uh, but it's an internal tool. It's always got like 10% of the features you want. It's always yeah. a little bit, you know, wonky. Um, we want to try to build a real version of it. And so, so that's what we set up to do. Okay, cool. And then, and then uh, how did you end up going up, uh, to market? Did you do a VC type thing or did, or did you kind of develop it in the back end and, and then just take it on your own? We, we basically did the, the VC route from day one. Okay. We didn't like, that was a, uh, we started it in 2013. It was like sort of a different era than today where it's, sure. you say, Hey, we're starting a company and some VC will write you a check for $20 million. <laughs> um, it was a little bit harder than that. Uh, but we like for, for better or for worse coming out of the acquisition, like the Amor acquisition was, was generally a good one. Um, there were a handful of people who made a bunch of money in Silicon Valley. If you make a bunch of money, you immediately turn around and like give it to your friends that are starting companies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we had sort of an easy path to, to sort of raising an initial seed money to being able to have introductions to other people around Silicon Valley. Like it was, it was an easy sort of, it, we, it was something we never even really thought about that much on honestly if like mm -hmm. should we kind of bootstrap it should we try to see how far we can get on our own and spend a bunch of time sure, developing sure. it and then see i think in hindsight like 
that is a perfectly reasonable approach and something that if mm-hmm. you're considering starting a company, you should certainly look into is like, which one do you want? Consider, taking, yeah. yeah, taking VC money sets you on a path that you can't get off. Like that is a one-way door. Um, yeah, it's a one-way door. And, and, and so <laughs> it, it, it wasn't something that we that we like really thought about. It was just kind of the natural thing to do. Yeah. Um, which is fine. I think, you know, it's, it, it's yeah. ultimately we would have done that no matter what, but, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was kind of our, our initial thought was like, all right, you do the sort of institutional route the whole way. So and, and how do you get to your first, you know, 10, 10 to 100 customers or zero to one, That's yeah, it. zero, zero, to, zero one. to one. I like zero to one better. Zero to one was, uh, friends. Basically, okay. I think like we knew some people who were data people in the ecosystem. So it was partly that mm-hmm. um, one of our very first customers was we like, I think we had a launch block. It was like a fundraising announcement or something where we yeah. were actually in the same office. So the customer was Twitch. Um, mm-hmm. We actually were in the same office as Twitch, like we're in the same building. Okay. And so somebody yeah, basically yeah. came and like knocked on our door. It was like, hey, I saw your thing. <laughs> We do data. What's up? Uh, <laughs> so, so there were a few things like that, um, and then sort of the the ten to a hundred. Uh, a lot of it was was, and it's always. I mean, still is the case. I would say today, uh, it's it's sort of community awareness. I think, mm-hmm. um, like Mode, I would not say is a community oriented company to the degree that some data companies are. It's not an open source product, which tends to be yeah, a little yeah. more sort of tied to community. Um, but it, it wasn't sort of like, let's, our approach was never, let's go raise a bunch of money. Let's buy a bunch of billboards on the 101 yeah, uh, yeah. And, and do this all through sort of paid marketing. It was like, all right, let's, we know some people in the space. Let's try to you know push the product out that way and, and see what happens. When did you know, like, it, was there a distinct moment where it's like, okay, we got something special here? I mean. It's probably why you were, it, yeah, getting it, VC money. Yeah. I mean, there are, I don't know. It, it is always something that feels like it's teetering. It's always the sort of thing where it's like, <laughs> oh, wait, this thing seems amazing. Oh, wait, this is never going to last. Uh, like, <laughs> I've uh, been there before. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. There, there are the moment, you know, I mean, I think when, when you start to have customers who use it and like it that you don't know, where they're yeah, like, yeah. wait a minute, these people aren't using this as a favor. They just like evaluated a bunch of things and thought this was the best. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's when you start to get confidence that you might be onto something. But but I think I don't know. I'm sure y'all are familiar with this too. That like you always are are a little bit weary that something is like this. this there's no way there. this actually is gonna actually like what what what's what's sort of the thing that has propped this up for so long and when does it fall down? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. that's, that's welcome yeah. to capitalism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. In, in, imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, it, so. It's tough sometimes because it, exactly as you described, sometimes you may have the good idea, but because you're so close to it, because you've been living with it, you, you yeah. begin to believe your, your own success, even though, you know, uh, even when the market is validating you, you're still questioning, are these people saying, do they really understand that, you know, <laughs> we're three people now, we're 10 people now. Yeah. 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 And we, we had, I mean, I think there's, there's certainly a lot of that from like, we all came from analytical backgrounds. We had our opinions about what this should look like. And I think Mm -hmm. it it, it is as with all these sorts of things, it's a double-edged sword where in some cases it's very valuable because we're like, okay, we're going to build the thing that we know is a problem that we have that you wouldn't pick up on interviews with people because you have to like live in their shoes to really get it at the same time that does create a lot of blind spots where you're like, these opinions are the right ones. And it's like, at some point you're like, Hey, you might've gotten that one wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Ben, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure having you on with us. Uh, really some great discussion and, and uh, you know, some great takeaways that I've, uh, I've taken from it. So uh, appreciate you joining us and uh, we'll put this one in the history books. Awesome. Thanks yeah. Thanks much. so much for, for having me. This is a good time. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks. so much, everybody. Next one day. Catch y'all later.